Okay, I think it's 10, so uh, let's get started. I have a lot of slides, so I probably shouldn't wait too long. Uh, welcome to my presentation on the new principled BSDF model in cycles. Uh, a more accurate title would be the upcoming new principled BSDF model in cycles, but when I submitted the talk, I thought it would be done by now. Uh, so yeah, just, uh, <laughs> it's coming soon, more on that later. Uh, first of all, quick overview, uh, what's going on in this talk. Uh, quick introduction, then, uh, why even a new principle BSDF, what's wrong with the current one, or rather what could be better with the current one. Uh, then some quick theory on shading, what's even going on, what are we trying to do, and then uh, finally the components of the new principle, uh, principle BSDF, uh, principle B2, what I'm calling it in development, uh, definitely not the final name. And uh, then at the end, uh, what is the current state, what's going on, uh, when can we expect, it, expect to see it. So yeah, uh, let's get going. Uh, First of all, who's talking to you? Uh, hi, Lukas Stockner here. I've been working on uh, Blender and specifically Cycles for eight years by now. Uh, crazy how time flies. Uh, some things you might know uh, that I've done are like light portals, multi-scattering GTX, one day later. The old denoiser before the AI took over. Uh, the IS lighting, UDIM support, AOV passes, and a lot of internal stuff that users don't really care about. Uh, I've worked with some studios before that use Blender and also just directly as a hobby. But uh, nowadays I'm actually uh, also working through the development fund directly on Blender, so that's uh, awesome. I'm also still in university, still uh, studying uh, computational science and engineering, uh, masters, almost done, but not quite. And I'm also part-time at Genesis Cloud still. Uh, so the point of this talk, I've already mentioned it, uh, on the one hand I want to talk about this new principle BSDF model in particular, uh, what's the current plan, what's the current state, uh, and also a bit of like, not really documentation, but just something to maybe point people to, to say like, hey, this is, these were some of the background decisions, if you want to know why things were done this way, uh, here's the slides. And also on the other hand, um, some might remember in 2019 I did a talk about uh, cycles internals, what is a rendering engine even doing and so on. So this is basically a follow up to that on more background information on shading. Uh, no worries if you've not seen it, uh, this is completely separate and I don't expect you to know the entire last talk. Uh, also throughout the talk I've got uh, references at the bottom. I don't think you'll be able to read it uh, here in the presentation but later when the slides are online, if you're interested in some background, some paper, something that's mentioned, just you can check it out there. So, why a new principle BSDF? Um, pr physically based shading in cycles uh, is an interesting topic. Uh, physically based as a term is, gets thrown around a lot and people mean different things by it. You could mean it on the one hand in a sense of just it's based on physical theory instead of just writing a renderer that produces images that kind of look nice, you write a renderer that produces the accurate images. In that sense, cycles has always been physically based because, well, it's a path tracer. Um, often, especially as a buzzword, I would say, it's used in a, to mean a very specific type of shading that comes mostly out of the game world even, uh, where you have, you know, your specular texture and your metallic texture and your roughness texture and so on. So, uh, this, in, the, uh, in this sense, the principle BSDF is uh, both of these things. Um, before 2017, Physically based shading in cycles was pretty much, uh, you had a bunch of shaders and you had to mix them together and you had to know what you're doing to get a decent result. Uh, a lot of people ended up doing PBR nodes that were floating around on various uh, websites and often they were just crazy complex. So uh, yeah, it was basically time to do something better there. Uh, a lot of people might remember this setup. I had to download 2.79 for the screenshot, but yeah, <laughs> uh, just a bit of nostalgia there. Uh, and then in 2017, we got the principled BSDF. Uh, this is based on research and work that uh, Disney published, uh, which they developed internally as a unified shading model to basically get away from every artist building their own massive shaders to getting a simple model that everybody can just use. Uh, the goals behind this were to have it be artist friendly, for it to be very intuitive, and for all controls to like, have an immediate immediate use. So you can see here this is taken from the Blender documentation on the various options and what they do. Uh, also the point was that this should be able to handle a wide range of materials. So ideally you would only need different shaders for very specialized stuff like hair maybe. Uh, and a nice thing about this shading model is that it was widely implemented at the time. So 
uh, there's a very good chance of you using a renderer that it has at least some form of this model. Uh, in cycles, this has several additional options over time. So we've added uh, real subsurface scattering, which is not in the original Disney work. Uh, we've added the multi-scattering GTX mode, again, more on that later, and the transmission roughness option is also not in the original. In cycles, this was uh, added in 2.79 and it's been default ever since. Uh, this was implemented by Pascal Schirn from Adidas, so all credit goes there. Uh, and that's a very nice shader and everybody's using it nowadays and people like it, so what's wrong with it? Uh, there's a few points that I have. Uh, one big one is that it was originally designed for a particular stylized look, I would say. Of course, it is physically based and so on, but, uh, well, Disney does not do architectural visualization, really. They don't care about uh, quantitatively correct results. They just want things to look nice. But cycle stuff does have a very wide range of users, and some of them do actually care about things being correct rather than, you know, nice looking and physically based. So, uh, yeah, this is one problem. Another problem is this multi-scattering that I mentioned. Uh, I implemented this back then because I thought it could be very useful and it could be if it was production ready. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, so this is supposed to fix the problem that the shader gets darker when you increase the roughness. It does that, but it also slows the render down. It adds additional noise and fireflies. And it's very complex code, and there are quite a few bugs with it uh, currently. And another problem simply is that the Disney BSDF back then was not designed to accommodate multi-scattering. Uh, so it's kind of like packed in there. Another problem is energy handling. So it does not conserve energy. With certain combinations, you can end up with more energy being reflected than is incoming, which is not great for path tracers. And it also does not preserve energy. So you can, uh, you get this darkening effect sometimes. Uh, another problem is that with all of these additional effects being added to it, the controls are not really as elegant as they used to be. So there's three IOR controls, for example. There's the real IOR, which is used for the uh, refraction. There's the subsurface IOR, which is not used for much, to be honest. It's just used to, for the albedo matching. And then there's the specular slider, which does not look like an IOR, but internally is converted to IOR for the specular highlights. Uh, one funny thing, which is one of the reasons why I even started all of this, was there was a bug report that if you set the specular slider above 12.5, you get black results. And the specular slider is supposed to be a percentage. You're not supposed to set it to 12.5. And when I asked what are you doing? The answer was, well, I have this particular IOR value that I want. So I looked in the code and found the formula to convert and I inverted it. And I found that I need to set the specular slider to 13 to get the IOR that I wanted. And that's not an ideal workflow that we should do better than that. <laughs> uh, some other options are just not there that users might want uh, on the metal side in particular. There are some things that we could add and are now adding. And some controls are just kind of pointless, like the subsurface color, I often see people hooking up complex shaders to this input and everything. It doesn't really do much. All it does is when you drag up the subsurface slider, it mixes the subsurface color with the base color and uses that instead. But because people usually set the subsurface slider to like 0 0.01, it barely has any influence. But a lot of people just don't know that and put way too much effort into picking a subsurface color. So that's not great. Uh, and also simply, you know, time moves on. Uh, this original. The uh, paper came out in 2012, there was an improvement in 2015, cycles got in in 2017, but of course uh, research is still happening and in particular in the last five years there's been a lot of work uh, going on in this field, a lot of people presenting new approaches, improvements, and well, we should have those because they are put, uh, in particular address many of the problems that I've just mentioned. Uh, also, just some quick points, it doesn't play well with subsurface because the original model was never supposed to have real subsurface. So it's not ideal. Uh, this multi-scattering problem, there are better approaches. Comes back to this research point. The sheen option is not even a real sheen. It's, it was designed back then, from what I understand, to some of, sort of work around this darkening problem by just making things brighter. And it's not really a sheen in the sense that people want to use it for, for cloth, for example. Uh, and also one, import, one important point uh, that I think is uh, we really need to pay attention to is there's, be, there's progress in the industry. So for, for a long time, the way I remember it with uh, exchanging data between DD software was geometry is easy, rigs are kind of complex, shading just don't even bother because every software does its own thing. But nowadays, 
the shading models are starting to converge. Everybody does very similar things. Everybody has their own in-house option that some artists wanted, but overall, pretty much every the commercial software and also uh, game engines and so on and so on has very similar settings now. So we should we should support those. You know, Material X, GLTF, USD, commercial software game engines. Also, all, all of them do similar things nowadays. So we should definitely be compatible with that. Principle. Uh, the existing principle BSDF is kind of close, but yeah, many of the new elements are just missing. So that's uh, just the list of uh, motivations. And now before we go to the solutions, uh, a bit of background uh, to understand some of the problems and what the solutions are even doing. So shading, before you go to shading, you have to understand what even is light. Uh, in real life, Light is very complex. You can spend your entire life studying physics and still have no clue what's actually going on because depending on which field you're in, it, you just need very many different, uh, many different models. Uh, but in rendering, it's, we make it quite simple for ourselves. We just say, okay, we do geometric options. Light is a ray. This ray bounces around and we are happy. Uh, so this means we ignore wave physics. We ignore polarization. We assume that light just has infinite speed and so on and so on. Mostly this is fine, but you start to get into problems when you look closer because uh, many fundamental properties of objects can only be explained by these advanced effects, so we can just completely ignore them. Instead, what we do is we look at these effects on paper, we use them to derive a mathematical model for shading, and then we just use that model with the geometric optics. Uh, one classic example is this black body radiation node uh, that you would use for... Uh, for hot objects in cycles or for light sources. Um, to actually derive what's going on there, you need quantum physics. Actually, that's the historical reason why people started doing quantum physics. But of course, we don't do quantum physics in cycles. Instead, we just take the result, write it into render engine, and we're good to go. Uh, so this is sort of the approach that people take there. Um, I've said principle BSDF probably like 10 times by now. Uh, classic question, what even is a BSDF? It kind of just shows up in the Blender interface and people go with it. Uh, so there's a lot of these uh, B something DF uh, abbreviations that fly around in the uh, shading literature. Uh, what does this even mean? Uh, a BSDF is a bidirectional scattering distribution function. And what it does is it tells you how much light is reflected or more generally scattered from one direction to another direction. So you have this classic diagram here. You have some surface. You have a position where you're looking at. You have an incoming and outgoing light. Uh, to make things not confusing at all in cycles, the omega O is labeled as I in the code. There are reasons for it, but it's, it's one of these things. Uh, and yeah, this model just tells you how much light is being reflected. Uh, the different ones that were in the title are just variations on this, so BRDF and BTDF are the reflected and transmitted parts respectively. BSSRDF is what you get when you start to do subsurface scattering where you have an entry and an exit position and not just local scattering. But this does not really matter for this talk, just to go over, to go over some of the terms there. Uh, what we actually need from a BSDF? For render, we need two things. We need to be able to evaluate the BSDF for given directions. Like we know we have an incoming ray, we know we have a light source, how much is reflected. And for an incoming ray, we need to pick an outgoing position. Um, in this talk, I'm going to completely ignore the second point because that's getting too much into the implementation. So we just assume that if we can calculate everything, we are happy. So what's going on? What should our shading model do? I mentioned physical processes. What are these? Uh, on a microscopic level, there are roughly two categories you can look at. You have, on the one hand, light in a material where what happens to it is it gets absorbed, where the energy turns into a different form of the light turns into a different form of energy, and you have scattering processes where the light changes its direction in the medium. And then there's a separate type, uh, which is the interaction at material boundaries, where you have a difference in the speed of light in the material. So the speed of light in air is pretty much the same as in vacuum, but in gloss, for example, it is slower. So what happens when the light hits such a boundary is you get a reflection and you get a refraction. So the part that goes into the material changes direction and the reflected part just comes back. And there's a certain, a certain uh, balance between those two. Uh, more on that in a few slides. Uh, this difference in speeds of light is the index of refraction. 
Uh, all of this is nice, but of course this does not this does not match the full range of materials that you see in the real world. So what's going on there? Uh, what's going on there is that we, of course, do not see on a microscopic or atomic perspective, and we only see the overall effect of what's going on on this on the scale. So pretty much what happens on the surface uh, depends on the material properties there. The two rough categories are conductors and dielectrics. Conductors are materials that conduct electricity, dielectrics don't. Um, for conductors, what you end up with, th with is that they reflect a lot of energy. Uh, the reflection is colored because the amount depends on the wavelength that you're looking at. And while metals technically do also refract the light into them, they have very strong absorption inside of them. So as soon as you get past a few microns, there's just pretty much nothing left. So for all practical purposes, you can say that metals are opaque. Uh, for dielectrics, on the other hand, you have a quite low reflectivity. Uh, you don't get any colors on them, unless special cases, uh, for those who were at the iridescence talk yesterday. And uh, you get the reflected light that just continues inside the material because typically by themselves these materials do not uh, absorb very much. Uh, and the interaction inside the volume, you can sort of divide into three categories. That's the case where the scattering is extremely dense. So the light immediately scatters around all over the place. This ends up looking diffuse to our eyes. Uh, then you have the case where the scattering distance is a bit higher. That's usually what we call subsurface scattering in computer graphics. And then you get the case where the scattering distance is far enough that you can't get away with cheating anymore. And that's where you need the actual volumetrics then. So in theory, you could just render everything with pure volumetrics, but it would be just extremely slow, of course. Which is, again, comes back to this point of we take the effects and we sort of boil them down into a mathematical model because for many cases diffuse shading is perfectly fine, you don't need the volumetrics. Uh, I've said a lot now about light gets reflected and some light gets reflected and there's a certain uh, ratio between them. What is this ratio? Uh, the answer is the Fresnel equations. Uh, Fresnel is another one of these terms that everybody knows. Uh, but what exactly is behind it? Well, it tells you how much light is reflected and whatever isn't reflected gets refracted and then maybe absorbed. Uh, in theory, in the general case, the Fresnel equations can get very complex. So I just included this here for a quick taste. This isn't even the full model. So in general, you have cl complex valued indices of refraction. Uh, you have complex valued output from this. This is not even shown here. This is just the real case. Uh, it depends on the polarization of the light and it depends on the wavelength of the light. Luckily, in rendering, we, don't, we usually don't need the full form, so we can, we can do a lot of shortcuts. Uh, for one thing, we assume that light is not polarized, and we generally ignore the phase shift that happens. So we just care about the amount of light that's reflected. We don't care about the phase shift of the wave because humans can see it. Uh, so then two, two relevant cases remain. Uh, again, dielectric and conductive. Uh, for the dielectric case, we have indices of refraction that are just a single number. And it does not depend on the wavelength. So most of the complexity goes away, and we're only left with a fairly simple formula that depends on the index of refraction and the incoming angle of the light. Uh, this is what the Fresnel node and cycle stars, and this is what you use for like glass or plastics or water or any ice, any of these typical transparent materials. Then there's also the second case, which is uh, conductive Fresnel. Uh, this is uh, what happens for metals. There you have the complex valued index of refraction, and it also changes with wavelengths. So you usually see this written as n and k, for example. Uh, it's a bit more complex, but this is what you compute for metals. An example for what these functions look like is this. So here you see the reflectivity versus the incoming angle. The white line is glass, and the colored lines are the RGB values for uh, nickel, for example. So yeah, what you see here is uh, if the light comes in fairly uh, fairly uh, from like vertically, you have very low refraction, and as you get to the more grazing angles, it always goes up to 100%. Uh, for glass, the base reflection is fairly low. It's usually like 4% or something like that, whereas for metals, it's much higher. And for metals, it's also different for the different colors. So here, for example, you see that nickel has kind of a yellowish hue because the red is stronger than blue. Um, but even with these approximations I just mentioned, the equations can still be quite expensive to compute. Nowadays, that's kind of fine, but people also wanted to do it 20 years ago. So back then, it was very much not fine. So there's this famous approximation, the Schlick-Fresnel, uh, where what you basically do is you compute this reflectivity at zero degrees. You call it F0, therefore, Fresnel, zero degrees. Uh, 
And then you just look at the angle and compute this and mix it with white and that's it. That's the entire Fresnel. Uh, this is surprisingly accurate. Uh, the only parameter is this F0. You can compute this from the IOR, again, fairly straightforward. Or for artistic control, you can just let the user directly pick F0. And the, while I say approximation, there are arguments to be made that at least for metals and at least if you're not doing speckle rendering, this might actually be better than just doing the full Fresnel on the RGB terms. Uh, for more info, just very good presentation here. Uh, um, so here's a comparison. This is what you get if you use this approximation. Again, the glass and the nickel case. And here's the, uh, here's the real formulas. So you see for the white line, it's quite close. For the metals, there's a noticeable difference because metals have this tendency to dip in reflectivity a bit before they go to 100%. And yeah, this, uh, this F0 model does not reproduce this. Uh, what are the advantages of it? Uh, it's very fast to compute because you already have this cosine thing, so it's really just a bunch of multiplications and you're done. Graphics cards like that. It's quite accurate. It's decent for metals, but we can do better. And uh, one very big thing that has made this very popular is it's linear with respect to this F0 parameter. So if you have two materials, instead of computing both materials and then averaging them, you can just average the F0 and then compute it once and you get the same result, which is very nice for mixing and real-time applications and so on. So especially in the gaming and real-time world, this is the Fresnel model. People that don't even care about the real equations. Uh, everybody uses this. There's two well-known workflows, like spec gloss and metallic roughness. In the first one, you pre-compute this entire F0 term and just store it in the texture. In the other one, you have your metallic parameter and so on and so on, and then you compute the F0 in the game engine. Uh, but both of them work out to the same model in the end. Uh, so, so much for reflection, that's kind of nice. But so far, I've always talked about perfect reflection. So mirror style, light comes in, light goes out, same angle. Uh, of course, that's not always what happens. Um, uh, if you also have rough, glossy objects in real life. Uh, what's happening there is, again, we have microscopic versus macroscopic. Uh, that's kind of a recurring, talk, uh, recurring theme in this section. Uh, on the microscopic level, things do, in fact, reflect perfectly, but the geometry is very uneven. So on rough objects, you just have lots of fine surface detail. If you look at it, it looks like a flat surface to you, but then from the macroscopic perspective, the reflection gets rough. So how can we model this? Oh, uh, in computer graphics, you usually d divide this into three layers in your hierarchy. So you have the very rough detail, which you handle through geometry. Then you have a bit finer detail. For that, you have normal maps. Then you have the super fine detail, where you really don't care about the specifics. You just put that into the material model uh, to get your nice glossy reflections. The way this works is through so-called microfacet models. Uh, you assume that each facet is perfectly smooth and a perfect reflector, uh, and you assume that they are randomly distributed. Uh, there's many different uh, distributions for this. Again, terms you see floating around, TGX, Beckman, GTR1, Blindfong, and so on. These are all just different statistical distributions for these orientations of these rough surfaces. And the higher you drag the roughness slider, the wider distributed they are, of course. Um, how can we compute this? Uh, so this is kind of what it looks like. We assume we have this rough surface. We know we have incoming and outgoing direction. So we know what direction the surface needs to point in order to get a nice reflection where the angles are equal. So if we know this direction, we can look up how likely is it based on our distribution. And then we need to compute the Fresnel term. Uh, what's important here is to get accurate and real life results. You need to compute this Fresnel term on the microfacet, so based on that reflection angle, not the angle to the bigger surface. That's one of the things that Cycles is, was unable to do before the principle BSDF, and uh, that's something you're still unable to do if you just use the glossy node, uh, because yeah, you need to implement this sort of thing directly in the shader, because in, the, in your node tree, you don't know the incoming direction yet, so you have no chance of computing this. Uh, yes, and one problem there that we start to run into and that messes things up is that these, if the surface gets rough, the facets can kind of cast a shadow on each other and block each other. And that's where the darkening comes from, more on that later. Uh, that's nice and all. Uh, we now have one shiny surface, but sometimes we want to combine them. For example, you have this classy, uh, classic glossy on diffuse. 
that we saw earlier, how do you do this? That's a uh, classic example of layered materials. So you could again do this explicitly in your renderer by just having like three object stacks on top of each other with some sort of displacement between them. But the noise you would get is crazy. So we just again bake this into the material modeler. And what we assume there is the layers are stacked on top of each other. The light comes from the top and then something reflects off the top, something goes into the layer, then maybe gets reflected lower or even gets transmitted into the material. And at some point, either at the top or the bottom, the light comes out again. And we assume the layers are thin enough that this difference here between the incoming and the exit point does not matter. It just, we assume it's all one point. Uh, so that's how layered materials are typically implemented. And now uh, conserving and preserving energy, also uh, one thing that I brought up before, uh, why is this important? Uh, energy conservation is absolutely essential for physically based renderers. Uh, if the surface reflects more energy than it gets, then we start to have problems. And in practice, this can lead to uh, noise and renders not converging and weirdly bright, uh, weirdly bright uh, regions and objects. And of course, in theory, it's also completely unphysical. This can never happen in the real world. Uh, one reason why this can happen is that people just add layers on top of each other. So if you just take a diffuse and then add a reflection on top of it, well, the ref diffuse is already designed to re uh, reflect all lights. So if you add a reflection, you now reflect light twice, which is not ideal. Uh, the way you want to account for this is to say, only the light that does not get reflected by the top layer should hit the bottom layer. But it's sometimes not that easy to compute how much light it actually gets uh, through, especially when you do this Fresnel on the micro facet and so on and so on. So in practice, what people nowadays do is they just pre-compute all of that. So this is known as albedo scaling. You just have a lookup table where you look up, I know my roughness, I, look my, I know my incoming angle, I know my index refraction, how much light gets through. You compute this once and then you just use it. And honestly, it's good enough. Um, then conserving energy is nice and all. What about preserving energy? It's kind of the opposite. We don't want to create energy out of nowhere, but we also don't want to lose it to somewhere. Um, yeah, materials should not lose energy unless the user really wants it by setting them darker. Uh, common problem with this is micro facets, where the facets can shade each other, but the mathematical model that uh, is typically used only accounts for a single reflection. In real life, you would have multiple bounces on these facets, but with the classic model, at least it just doesn't happen, so the light is simply lost. Uh, this then ends up looking like this, so there are five spheres with increasing roughness, and they should ideally have the same color as the background, because, well, they should reflect all light, but they don't. Uh, this is what it would look like with the multi-scattering GGX, so this is the accurate version, and you see that the, the spheres all blend into the background. Uh, ideally, we would want that. And especially for rough materials, the difference is just night and day, basically. This is the same color, the same everything, just accurate or not. Uh, how, do, how can we, how can we uh, solve this problem? Uh, well, darkening is one problem. Another problem actually is, or not problem, an effect that we're missing is that materials get more saturation as they get rougher. Because if it bounces multiple times, you also have the Fresnel effect multiple times. So the color of the surface kind of stacks up. And again, this is, not, this is lost if we don't account for this. So there is a numerical model to handle this. This is the multi gg exits in Blender right now. Downside, as I said, it's not that great for production. People are researching it. There are being imp the improvements are being made, but it's not at the point yet where you really want to use it. So why not just fake it? Um, there are two ways to do this that came up since 2017. Uh, one of them is you kind of, again, pre-compute what the additional bounces would be and add them to the model. And the second one is even simpler. We again do the albedo scaling. We just pre-compute how bright is the object, and then we divide by that, or divide by one minus that to force it to become bright enough to basically reflect everything in the end again. Uh, the downside is that the exact distribution of the reflection is not accurate, but the overall brightness is, and honestly, that's, that's usually good enough. Uh, you also account for the saturation. There are ways to do that. Uh, and then you can end up with something that looks pretty close. So uh, here's an example. Again, the picture from before. This is what this single scattering looks like. This is what the reference multi-scattering looks like. And this is the approximation. So you see on the right-hand side, the shadow is not quite the same. This is because of this directional dis difference. 
but the brightness is the same and honestly that's all you really care about in practical scene. You're not going to see this, this shader difference on the right. Uh, and then the final point in the theory before we get to the actual principle V2 uh, is so-called thin sheets. Uh, this is another common type of material. For example, uh, you might see this on leaves or on paper uh, where the object is so thin that in practice you don't really want to model it. Like if you were really physically accurate and you wanted to do a uh, leaf, for example, you would need to take a box and scale it all the way down so it's like one millimeter thick. But in practice, people just use planes. But the problem with this, of course, is that if you then do refraction on this, for example, the refracted ray is just going to continue on and on because it never hits the back surface because, well, you didn't model it. So can we do something about that? Yes, we can. Once again, we can turn this into a mathematical model where we say, you know what, we handle both these bounces in a single hit. So on the top, there's the classic example, what you would in theory need to do. And on the bottom, there's just this thin sheet approximation where you say, whatever, it's thin enough that we compute the entry and the exit refraction at the same step. And in the end, the ray just kind of goes through and changes color and gets uh, reflected. Uh, there are some subtleties to this where if you have roughness, then since the roughness kind of applies twice, the outgoing roughness is, has to be wider than the reflected roughness. But again, there are papers on how to account for this. And in practice, just a simple factor. And then it looks very similar. And it's good enough uh, for practical applications, I would say. So, so much for theory. Now, new principle V2. What's going on? Uh, fundamentally, again, this is a layered model, as the old one was. Uh, on the high level, the changes compared to the old one are that it now conserves and preserves energy by default. Uh, you can easily test this by just taking the model, setting the background color to white, just taking a sphere, and no matter what you do on, this, on the new model, it should not be brighter than the background. On the old model, it is very easy to run into that case. And it should also be as close to a background as possible. It should never be just dark gray or something. Uh, so this means that it's much more intuitive for artists to pick colors, for example, and you can change parameters, change roughness without being worried that you need to account for this by increasing your color to kind of get the same look again. Uh, one thing that I think is a, a notable change is it will be fiscally accurate out of the box. So a bit more on the physical side than the old principle PCF, which was really 100% artist driven only. Uh, but of course, artistic control is still important. So there will be additional artistic controls on, uh, on it. So by default, the model is designed to be physically accurate. But if you say, I don't care about physics, I want this reflection to be pink, then you can just go into the, uh, you can just go into the artist controls and set your reflection to pink, uh, knowing that now it's not physically accurate. But if you don't care, that's, that's perfectly legitimate. Uh, the sheen component, as I said, kind of pointless. So it will be replaced by a new and actually useful one. Uh, metallic and clear coat components are being improved. Uh, there is this thin sheet mode that I mentioned, which will be added to it, and there's some quality of life improvements, more on that uh, right at the end. So what's the layer stack looking like? We start with a very with the basic of basis of the material. We have a diffuse layer, which can also be subsurface, depending on what you use as your subsurface radius. If it's zero, then it's just diffuse, otherwise you get subsurface. On top of that, we have this dielectric specular reflection uh, that gets controlled you know, by the roughness slider. Then also there's uh, metal in addition to it. Uh, I've put this next to it in the diagram to basically show you can mix between those. So you have metal or you have diffuse plus specular depending on your metallic slider. Then there's also the transmission component, of course. You have the transmission slider. So this just models uh, pure dielectric, which refracts into the material. Classic example being glass, of course. On top of all of these, you have your sheen layer, uh, which is supposed to model, uh, for example, uh, fibers or hairs on top of the material. Uh, the classic example where people use this is uh, peach fuzz, is the one that comes up in all the papers, or just for, for cloth. This is a very important effect. On top of that, there's the classic uh, clear coat layer, where you can get an additional dielectric reflection on top of metals as well as, uh, so yeah, you can get this on top of whatever you want. And then there's also, uh, just for utility, there's the transparency option still, and there's still emission that are just added onto everything else in one box. So that's the overall model. Uh, so let's look at them in more detail. There's the base layer, which has the three types of material. There's the diffuse type, 
diffuse covered by dielectric uh, microfarad specular layer. Uh, depending on what you set your subsurface scale to, it automatically switches. And uh, for one implementation detail is that it uses the same microfacets as the metallic layer, uh, just for performance reasons. So if you have a bit of metallic and a bit of diffuse, you don't need to do the entire microfacet computation twice, but it just uses the same layer and mixes different L terms. Uh, this way it's much more performant. One interesting result of this is that the anisotropy also applies to the diffuse specular, but for some materials you might actually want that, like for brushed plastic. I don't know if that's a real-world thing, but if it is, you can now simulate it. Uh, then there's the transmission type. This is just pure dielectric, and this does not share the microfacets with the other two. Uh, on the one hand, this is to not have anisotropy there, because I'm not sure how realistic it would be, and also because this way we can compute the decision to reflect or refract based again on the microfacet Fresnel. This actually makes a considerable effect on the look. Uh, I found that when I implemented this multi-scattering approximation for the gloss look, this microfacet-based reflection or transmission is more important than the overall brightness thing to just making it look more realistic. So that's why it's uh, a separate thing in the code. And then there's the metallic layer. This is where it gets interesting. So I showed you that the F0 Fresnel model does is not really super accurate for metals, and we can do better there. So how can we do better? What are our options? We could just continue using the F0 model. That's what the current principle BSDF does, but, well, it's not really. You get, ignore this edge darkening effect, which is not nice. So we could use the real conductive Fresnel equations. That way it would be super accurate. But the problem is that they are quite expensive to compute, and complex IOR is just unintuitive for artists. You can look it up in online tables, but if you say, hey, I want this metal to look a bit different, Good luck figuring out which values are going to make it look different in the way that you want. So that's not really a fantastic option. Uh, then there's this artist-friendly conductive Fresnel paper, which has a method where the user selects an edge color and a base color, and it automatically computes this complex IOR for you. Uh, it's fairly widespread, but the problem is that you still have to compute the uh, conductive Fresnel, and on top of that, you also have to compute the conversions. It's even more expensive. And this thing I mentioned, this other talk I mentioned before with uh, the F0 is perhaps as accurate as the real one, also has very good theoretical reasons why, on a theoretical basis, this artist-friendly formulation is not ideal, especially when you look towards spectral rendering and topics like that. Uh, then one interesting option is the so-called generalized F0 model, where the idea is that instead of always going to white at 90 degrees, you let the user select the color at 90 degrees, and you also, instead of always doing the power of five, you let the user select that as well to control the fall off a bit. It's nice, but an even nicer model that I found, or that was uh, shown to me, is the F82 tint model. So what does this mean? Uh, this means that it's based on the F0 model, but you have an additional parameter that controls the, op the appearance around 82 degrees, which is around where this uh, dip is supposed to happen. So the idea is originally, in the original source for this model just had you input the color at this area, at this angle, but this modified version, which was published by Adobe in their standard surface material, where you multiply the reflectivity by a certain factor instead, which is nice because then if you just set it to white, it doesn't do anything, and you get the old F0 model, which is compatible with what game engines and so on and so on doing, are doing. So this is why I really like this model, and this is quite cheap to compute. Uh, if you want to match real metals, uh, I have a script for that. It's linked in, on developer.blender.org. What you do is you compute your reference spectrum by using the real conductive Fresnel equation. I just do this in Python. Then you convert it to uh, whatever linear color space you want to use, and then you do a numeric fit to choose the parameters. I don't expect users to do this, so I did it for a few well-known metals and just put all of the values in on developer.blender.org. We can put that in the documentation at some point. Uh, one thing that is often brought up in documentation and papers, even commercial software sometimes has this in their manual, where they say, just pick three wavelengths, like 450-ish for blue, 550-ish for green. Uh, you can do that, but it's much more accurate if you do it with this, uh, with this proper computation. So what does this look like? Again, here's our basic F0 model. So here's what our nickel looks like. We don't have this edge darkening. Here's the reference again, what it should look like, and here's what the new model gives you. So you see that we have this darkening effect and it's much more accurate. Uh, of course, 
graphs are nice, but pictures are nicer. Uh, I need to warn you, I am not an artist by any means, so do not expect any fancy pictures. But yeah, this is uh, basically uh, chromium and nickel. This is the old model with just F0, and this is the new one. So you see the difference isn't big, but around the edge there is a noticeable difference. And for some metals it is more pronounced, for some it is less. Uh, iron, for example, is another big case. Uh, for copper it just doesn't matter, for example. But yeah, if you want super accurate uh, reproduction of colors, this, this is kind of nice. Um, so much for metals. Now back to this dielectric case on, uh, on, on the diffuse space. You would, might think it's just dielectric vanilla. I said this is the easy case, this is a nice equation. How hard can it be? Uh, turns out very hard uh, because the challenge there is that people like to do their own thing. Uh, for example, the principally one has the specular slider for this that converts to IOR and then computes it. Uh, game engines often do the spec loss thing where you just have your F0 texture and they also bake metallic into that. So we kind of want to be compatible with all of that. Um, there's a solution for this which the, is, comes from the GLTF specification where you add some additional inputs. So you have your IOR, you compute your F0 based on that, then you multiply that with one tint factor, then you apply this, uh, this schlick fanel model on top of it, and then you apply everything with a second tint factor. So this, this seems com uh, complex, but ideally this uh, will be, this will be uh, quite intuitive, I hope, and ideally this, these are all the non-physical controls. So as a user, you don't really have to touch this, this is more interesting for automatic importers, for example. Uh, one neat thing about this is that you said if you set the IOR to zero, then the default model is just full reflection everywhere. So then you can use this tint factor to just directly input any F0 you want, which is how this is compatible with this whole spec gloss workflow. Uh, one thing that's not yet clear uh, is which Fresnel term do we then use? Do we use the real one or do we just purely use the approximation. I'm tending towards the real one because for some corner cases it is much more accurate, but we'll have to see. Of course the problem then is the real one doesn't have this tint input, so what you then do is you compute the real value and you rescale it to, what, to the range of what the other one would have. That's also what principally one do, v, V1 does right now. Uh, so that's that. Uh, next part, sheen layer. As I said, the old sheen is just an ad hoc fix to kind of try to work around this energy loss problem. Since this problem is kind of addressed now, we might as well have a proper sheen instead. Uh, there is one. Again, uh, here's the reference. Uh, this is a model from Sony Imageworks. Uh, it's based on the microfacet approach again, but instead of saying, okay, we have this rough surface, the idea is that you look at fibers. So it's basically a flip by 90 degrees and the reflection is always of fibers that stand on the surface. And again, you have this roughness input to control the distribution of them. Uh, there's no Fresnel term in this model. Instead, there's just a tint, tint input where you can set your color because, well, this is already such an approximation that trying to be physically accurate about it is uh, not really worthwhile. Uh, unfortunately, Adobe appears to use a different sheen model. Uh, theirs is based on microflake theory. From what I can see currently, the, the first one is more widely supported, like GLTF, Material X, and so on and so on, all use it. So I'm going with that one for now. If there's really strong feedback on, hey, the other one is so much better, please can we have that? Of course, there's also an option. Uh, for comparison, what does it look like? Again, uh, image warning, uh, this is not very artistically uh, fancy, but I hope it gets the point across. So this is just basic diffuse material with uh, no sheen applied. This is the old sheen. You can see it just kind of makes it a bit brighter, but not much else going on. And then with the new sheen model, it looks like this. So you get this velvet style effect, kind of like the old velvet BSDF, except that you don't have this hard, this hard corner that the old one used to have. Um, also, one important point is this is at 100% in the old model, and this is just 15% in the uh, new one. So you can really crank this effect if you want to. It would look stupid here because the base is so dim, but if you have a, a lighter material than you might actually want to turn this up higher. Uh, here's a nicer picture from the original paper where you can see this roughness effect. And basically at low roughness, it only really affects the edges, but the further up the roughness goes, the more it goes towards the center of the material. Uh, then there's a clear coat layer. Uh, this was already uh, in place in principle V1. It's fine as is. I haven't seen any 
good reason to change it. So there's no like major breakthrough in research or anything in that area. Some people let you choose, some render engines let you choose the IOR, some choose a different microfacet distribution, but I, I don't really see this as super important. We could add it, but I don't think it's particularly, uh, particularly important. Uh, one thing I did add though is clear code tint. Uh, why is this relevant? A, a common thing that comes up in this, principally uh, in this physically based discussion is colored reflections. So people say, I want, uh, I want my colored reflections. Then the theory people say, no, reflections are always white. You're not supposed to have colored reflections. Then people say, I want them anyways. So why do they want them? Uh, one reason why you might actually have colored reflections is if you have a coating on your material that is tinted. So then the reflection on the underlying surface actually is white, but because of absorption in the layer above it, you end up seeing a colored reflection. So why not implement that? And the way I'm doing this is just, you look at the incoming ray, you compute the refraction, then you look at the distance that the ray travels in your clear coat layer, and you uh, just do volumetric absorption based on that. Uh, so the color you input is for just uh, vertical, uh, just if you look at it vertically, it has that color, and the flatter you look at it, the more saturated the color becomes because the light travels a longer distance. Uh, one thing that caught me at the start, you need to look, you need to compute the refraction of the ray and then compute the length. If you don't do that, you get crazy saturated edges because the ray just goes forever in the material. Um, so yeah, uh, one thing to note with the clear coat layer is this refraction effect does not actually affect the lower materials. So we compute this refraction to get the tint, but the actual incoming direction that's used for the lower layer is still the original. Uh, it would be way too hard to implement this interaction and honestly, it does not really make a difference. I tried it, it's, it's a small detail. There are papers that do all of this accurately, but it's 30 minute pre-processing time before you start rendering just to pre-compute all terms. So <laughs> not yet practical once again. <laughs> Uh, here's an example of what it looks like. Uh, so here's just, this is without this effect. This is just, I took a metal and manually made it a bit redder. So this is a red shiny metal with a clear clear coat on top. And this is the same case with uh, uh, just pure aluminum with a red colored tint on top. So you see uh, where you look at it head on, it's very much the same, but towards the edges it gets a bit darker and has this nicer fall off. Um, Again, subtle detail, but for some cases, this makes an interesting difference. Also, this means that you can just use real physical values for an underlying metal and don't need to manually hack in your red metal color. Uh, yeah, what else is going on? Um, transparency and emission, no change there. Uh, volume controls are interesting. So in the old model, the base color affected everything, even transmission. So if you had glass and you set the base color to blue, you would get the light would be colored blue on refraction. That does not make any sense in terms of physics. Uh, refraction on dielectric objects is not supposed to change the color. Instead, if you have colored glass, what's generally going on is that there's, uh, there's coloring inside the actual model, so uh, inside the actual volume. So it should be volumetric and people just put a color on the surface and call it good enough. Um, instead, what many models are now doing and now what also principal V2 is doing, you have this absorption depth control where the refraction itself does not have any color, but you automatically add uh, absorptive uh, volume uh, inside it. And this absorption depth option basically says, how deep should, so you have this color input and the absorption depth says, at which depth should the object have this color? And then if it ends up being a thinner section, then it has less color, and if it ends up thicker, it has more color. Uh, and then of course, transmission is not colored if you apply this by default. Uh, some things about this is still unclear. You know that cycles or shading in Blender in general has the surface and the volume output. It's really annoying if you have to connect both surface and volume output of the principal BSDF, so this should somehow be done automatically. Uh, probably just a case of if you don't have anything plugged into the volume, it automatically acts as if it was connected for you. Another question is, do we also want a volumetric scattering option right in the principal BSDF? Could be done, not sure. Uh, We'll see. Uh, again, for a comparison, what this looks like, this is just a uh, simple glass. So this is the old model where you just apply a blue color with principle V1, and this is what it looks like with the new one. So you see the shape of the glass better, you see that there's actual thicker and thinner sections, the bottom looks a bit different. So yeah, just 
Again, none of this is groundbreaking. Oh my God, it looks 10 times better, but it's just the small things that let you model things more accurately. Uh, and then finally, we have the DIN sheet mode. Um, this is uh, uh, supposed to be a simple checkbox. You just say, hey, this is the DIN sheet, and then everything happens automatically. Instead of transmission, you just get the exit at the other end. This also disables subsurface scattering because if the object is so small, you're not, you can't really have any scattering in it. A few things are still unclear, like do we need translucent effects or is it enough to say I crank up the, rif the, uh, the roughness and the transmission kind of gives you the translucency effect by default, it needs to be checked. Uh, one thing I also want to add is a transparent shadow option. Uh, this is relevant for architecture, for example, when you want windows to have nice reflections but to not add any noise because, uh, because of caustics. Uh, what people often do is they just disable the shadow visibility, but that of course completely removes the shadow visibility. So if you have a colored glass, for example, you just don't get any color in the shadow. So the idea here is to have a checkbox that automatically for shadow rays replaces the principal BSDF with a transparent one with the correct color. So you would get the correctly colored shadows with absorption and everything without the noise and caustics. Could maybe even be automatic where if you have a low roughness, it does this by default. So yeah, uh, we're starting to come to the end. How does this all come together? I showed you the layer stack up before. We have the three base layer types. We just mix them together based on the metallic and transmission factors. Then clear coat and sheen are added on top with this albedo scaling to have the energy preservation and conservation where we pre-compute how much does the sheen reflect and we just don't let that through into the lower layers. Uh, again, all of the microfacet layers are scaled up to account for the single scattering energy loss. Uh, one downside of this is there are lots of small pre uh, lookup tables that need to be pre-computed, but you can do that once and it's just 100 values and you put those in the code and kind of forget about them because the model never changes, so the numbers also don't change. Uh, and yeah, all, uh, that's, the, that's the plant component, so now what is the current state, what's going on there? This is what the model inputs currently look like. You can see white is unchanged, green are new options, Red are removed options and yellow are modified options. Uh, for time reasons, I'm not gonna go over every single one of them, but you can see it's kind of similar, but even more options are being added, which is a problem, so that's my last slide. Uh, possible improvements, what could be done on top of that? Uh, iridescence, in the slides here, I still have it on possible improvements. After the talk yesterday, I've moved it up to, yep, this is cool, uh, I've seen what you can do with it, and we, we really want that, I think. Uh, the problem there is, it's not super trivial to combine this with this artistic controls because we're not using the real Fresnel, so we don't have the face difference. But for iridescence, it's actually important, so we might need to do some reverse thing where we compute the physical parameters from the artistic parameters and then use these, and there are ways to do it, but we need to figure out what really works there. Uh, dispersion support is something that people requested a few times, especially now that maybe spectral rendering is getting closer. This would be nice to have. Uh, nested dielectrics is a cool one where you have this classic example of you have multiple transparent or refracting objects that intersect. Classic example, liquid in a glass, where if you just do it the simple way, it looks really bad and right now you need to manually select the interface between the two and set the IOR to be one divided by the other. This is annoying, so it would be nice if the renderer automatically took care of that. And there's this approach called nested dielectrics that's quite popular for this and it should be possible to implement it. I haven't tried it yet, but I don't yet see a reason why it should not be quite straightforward. Uh, and also maybe all of these new components, the new sheen and so on. Principle is nice, but for people who want more control, we might as well add it as a regular node so you can do your own shader trees with it if you want to. And yeah, some open questions remain. User interface is a big one. We're adding even more controls. The shader already looks ridiculous. So what can we do about this? Uh, one idea is to sort this into sections. So I already had this on the previous slide where it's kind of divided into categories and the idea would be to maybe have expandable and collapsible panels where if you don't need anisotropy because you don't need a metal, you don't need the tangent input, you don't need ten, uh, rotation and so on and so on. So just have an anisotropy panel that you can close by default and if you really care, you can open it. Uh, also, compatibility with the existing principal BSDF is a very big topic that I'm not certain about yet. Ideally, we would just replace it and have it look similar enough that people don't care. 
in practice, I'm not sure if that's uh, possible. So worst case, we might just have to keep the old one, which is really annoying because there's a lot of code to it and we then kind of have to maintain both, but we'll have to see. Uh, and just a small thing, subsurface entry and exit is, is kind of an uh, annoying edge case where sometimes with the path trace subsurface scattering, you get these white corners. Uh, we might be able to do this better, we'll see. Uh, current status, way behind schedule. As I said, I wanted to have this done in time for now. I uh, had way too much things going on and uh, did not really have a chance to work on it much uh, the last few weeks, months. Uh, but now, uh, now I'm actually uh, back to it and after the conference I hope there will be very fast progress now. Uh, there's a branch for this on the gitblender.org. You can try it out. Uh, right now it's very outdated. Uh, after the talk I'm going to push a version with the latest master and then hopefully many additional changes. Uh, the basic components are mostly there. What is currently still missing is the thin sheet mode is not implemented yet. The volume controls are not implemented yet. A lot of things probably broke during development and need to be fixed. So OSL is just, does not work right now. Uh, color passes, so like diffuse color and so on and so on do not work. Cost the controls are kind of broken. Important sampling, so you get a lot of noises. And uh, EV right now just crashes because I changed the number of parameters so the GLSL shader doesn't compile anymore. Oops. Uh, but all of this can be addressed. Also performance needs to be checked and the open questions that I mentioned. Also in the end, just really checking with other software, if we use the same inputs, do we get the same results because the entire point is to be compatible and if it looks different, then that's kind of, kind of uh, against that goal. And we want to make sure that it's compatible before it goes to master because then we can change it anymore. And yeah, uh, that's it for me. Uh, afterwards, if you have any questions, any suggestions, any feedback, come talk to me if it occurs to you tomorrow. There's a thread on uh, DevTalk where you can just submit feedback as well. And that's it. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>